Oh, plus. Okay. So last time we talked about plane mirrors, which obeyed this simple rule. Uh, angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. And now we want to consider curved mirrors. So we're going to start out, uh, well, really we're only going to talk about one type of curved mirror, uh, which is a spherical mirror. So basically it's kind of what it sounds like. Say we have a sphere, which again, we're just looking at a cross section here. So that'd be a circle. And then let's erase a big portion of it. So again, we don't have to have a full sphere, but say we have like a concave. Yeah, so this is called a concave mirror. So a picture we're standing over here and the mirror is curving towards us. That's called concave. So I'm gonna kind of leave the whole So, yeah, this would be like the full cross-section of this sphere. And let's identify that point C right in the center. Now, let's say we have an object which we'll represent as an arrow. And let's consider, let's call this line that goes through the center of the mirror uh, the principal axis. So we're going to draw a ray that is coming in parallel to the principal axis. Now, how does light reflect off of a curved surface? Well, a curved surface, you know, light, we're considering a ray which has no width, really. Or a very small one. If you picture like a laser pointer, you know, the very small dot that it's going to create. And so, you know, when it hits the mirror, at least that area it hits can be considered flat. So we have like a normal vector or a normal line that would pass through the center of this uh, circle. Because it's a spherical mirror, it would have to pass through the center. And so looking at the angle of incidence and the angle of reflection, you know, it's going to bounce off like this. Okay. So uh, let's say it hits at point A, and let's call this point here where the principal axis, you know, hits the mirror, let's call that point B. And for reasons we'll see later, let's call the point where the reflected ray passes through the principal axis, let's call that point F. And what I'm going to say is that... Um, this line segment FA is approximately equal to the line segment FB. Now, it's only approximately equal. These two are only approximately equal to each other. Um, they don't look equal to each other. I mean, if you look at this FA and just, you know, kind of use your fingers as a compass, looks like FA is a little bit longer. But if we make this uh, object smaller, if we bring this the, our incident ray closer to the principal axis, the difference between these two line segments becomes smaller. And so as long as our rays are close to the principal axis, this is a good approximation. And uh, if that's the case, then... Um, we can see that this point F is going to occur right in the middle, like right in between the center and point B. And so we can, uh, yeah, let's just say F is equal, this distance, say CF, let's call it, or let's say FB actually, is approximately equal to one half the radius of the uh, the circle or the sphere that uh, this mirror is made for. Now, of course, if you're making a mirror, you wouldn't create an entire spherical object and code it with this, uh, you know, reflective mirrors. I think use aluminum typically. So you wouldn't actually create an entire spherical object and then just cut the ray, cut the rest, and throw it away. Um, but, you know, if you continue this curvature, it would form a sphere. Um, 
kind of a project I've always wanted to do is actually create a mirror. Like for astronomy, uh, some people actually grind their own mirrors. Uh, it's a pretty complicated process, but basically a mirror is just glass or some kind of glass-like material nowadays, but in the old days they were just pure glass. And you grind it, uh, grind these together to give it this curvature. And uh, yeah, I've never actually done it, but kind of wanted to. But anyways, uh, you have a glass surface, and then what you do is you coat it with a very reflective metal like silver or aluminum. So uh, yeah, kind of a fun project, but never got around to that. But anyways, um, yeah, we're not going to worry too much about this approximately equal side. Now, what we're going to say is that any ray that comes in parallel to the principal axis is going to pass through this point F. We call that the focal point. And we call this distance here between the mirror and the focal point the focal length. So what we have is the focal length is one half the radius of curvature of the mirror. Now, uh, this approximately equal thing does have some effect because, you know, if you consider a ray that's not very close to the principal axis, you'll miss the focal point. So if you have a bunch of rays close to the principal axis, they're all going to pass through that focal point. But if the rays start getting further away, they're going to miss the focal point a little bit. So if you create an image with a spherical mirror, it'll actually be a little bit blurry, and they call that spherical aberration, <clears throat> which is something you don't really want. However, even some telescopes, even a lot of telescopes, use spherical mirrors. Now, now there is a shape, there is a type of mirror that will focus any parallel ray directly through that focal point, that'd be a parabolic mirror. So if instead of a sphere, if you had a parabola, that would perfectly focus the light. If you had like a perfect parabola, wherever it hit, it's going to perfectly go through that focal point. So a sphere is uh, not as good. But even some high quality telescopes you can buy, you know, not just like going to Walmart and getting a $40 telescope, but uh, even, you know, the really nice ones, a lot of them use spherical mirrors because they're very, they're a lot easier to create than parabolic mirrors. And the spherical aberration isn't really noticeable unless you're going really, um, you know, real high quality, then they probably switch to parabolic mirrors. But yeah, spherical mirrors are good enough. So we don't have to worry about this approximately equal sum. Okay. Now, that raises a question, what kind of image are we going to get from a mirror like this? So, let's, let me redraw this. So, right now, what we've established is that the focal length is one half r. So, one half the radius of curvature. Now, if you look in the equation sheet, you'll see this, except there's a plus or minus sign in front of that one half r. And we'll talk about that later, so don't worry about it for now. So again, let's draw our mirror. Here's our center. And we know the focal point is right in the middle. Now what we're going to do is we're going to consider a concave mirror. And we're going to represent our object as an arrow. And we want to know what kind of image we're going to get out of this mirror. So we're going to start out, we know if we draw a ray parallel to the principal axis, when it reflects, it's going to go through the focal point. Let's call this ray 1. We know that anything parallel to the principal axis reflects to the focal point, so we can draw that. Uh, there is another ray we can draw. If we draw a ray that passes through the focal point, when it hits the mirror, it's going to bounce back parallel to the principal axis. So we're going to call that ray 2. And we can see that these two converge at this point. 
That's where our image is going to be. And in theory, we could just stop here and say, okay, we've done it. We know where these two rays converge and leave it at that. However, there's a third ray we want to draw because uh, especially if you're doing things by hand, um, I mean, there's obviously errors in this type of thing. You know, we have to be able to draw perfectly straight lines. We have to be able to draw parallel lines. And, uh, you know, I didn't bother measuring precisely. I just kind of eyeballed it. That's right in the middle. That's where our focal point's going to be. And probably the biggest challenge is actually just drawing a circle. Because, you know, that matters too. Like, if I drew this a little differently, maybe the, it would have hit differently and this would be a different angle. So these hand drawings are pretty crude, and they usually work, but uh, we can consider a third ray. Let's say we have a ray going through the center, and then when it hits, it's going to bounce straight back. So these three rays should meet at the same place. Um, you know, draw it reflecting back here. That's ray three. And they'll meet in this general area. So the actual image would be somewhere over here. So not the best drawing. So again, this is our object. This is the image. And what, what we can learn about that, again, you erase this circle. That just makes it impossible to even see the image. That's a little better. So we can notice a couple things about this image. Uh, first off, the image is smaller than the object. Just the, you know, this is that big, the image is smaller. So image is reduced in size. Okay, another thing we notice is that the image is inverted. You know, our object we represent as an upward arrow, the image is pointing down. So that is actually reversed. And um, another thing about this image that we can notice is that it is real. So again, if you're standing over here, you know, you see these beams coming from this direction. It looks like they're coming from here. Like, you know, like this is our object point. This is our image point. So like the light you see, it looks like it's coming from that point, and there actually is light coming from that point, so we call that a real image. So unlike the, um, the plane mirror, uh, this particular example, we have a real image. All right, so a few things. Uh, now, there's more we can actually learn from this diagram as well. Uh, just like before, this distance here from here to here, this is the object distance, and this here is the image distance, di. And theoretically, we can measure it. We could actually get a meter stick and measure this distance, get do, and get di, and see how they're related to each other. Uh, but we're not going to actually do that. Um, the next topic, we're going to derive an equation that relates DO, DI, and F. But for now, I mean, if you draw this accurately enough, this is a perfectly valid way of finding DI. Okay. Um, let's move on. So we can create this image with these three rays. Let's review the three rays. So ray one, parallel to the principal axis, goes through the focal point. Ray 2 goes through the focal point and then bounces back parallel to the principal axis. Ray 3 goes through the center and bounces straight back. However, we have to consider another case. So I'm going to erase this. I'm going to draw this a little bigger. Probably, I think if I draw it bigger, I'm going to distort it. It's not as spherical this time, but close enough. So here's our center. So right in the middle would be our focal point. What if we have our object between the focal point and the, uh, the mirror? 
And again, you can actually see this just with a spoon. A spoon, of course, isn't spherical, but it is concave and curved towards you. So you can actually kind of use this as a small mirror. So let's consider what these rays would look like in this case. So first one, parallel to the principal axis, and then through the focal point. Okay. So that one's no problem. Now, ray 2, remember when our object was over here, we said ray 2 goes through the focal point and then comes back parallel to the principal axis. Well, how are we going to do that now? Well, what we do is, because, you know, we, the focal point is behind us. So what we do is we go away from the focal point. So, like, we start here, but move in this direction away from the focal point. And then when it hits the mirror, it bounces back parallel to the principal axis. Okay, so that's uh, the first two, and let's stop there for a minute. Now, if you're standing over here, you know, the image is where these beams converge. Well, these two are moving away from each other. They're not going to converge, so all we have to do is trace them backwards. And it looks like, so again, this was our object. That's our image is behind the mirror and virtual, kind of like a plane mirror. However, in this case, the image is magnified. The image is bigger than the object. So it's kind of acting like a plane mirror, except it's distorting things and making the image bigger. Oh yeah, and ray three would go, you know, through the center, or come from the center, and then bounce straight back through the center. But if we trace it backwards, you know, they all kind of meet up at a point. So that's how we do it. So for a concave mirror, we consider, we have to consider each side of the focal point. So they kind of basically follow the same rules. We could state them um, like our object and the focal point, just draw a line through those two points hitting the mirror. And then, um, yeah, ray two, or no, ray one, sorry, we just go, we always start ray one parallel to the principal axis and then through the focal point. But ray two, you know, there's a line connecting the focal point and the object, and then just, you know, go towards the mirror, whichever direction you need to go. So, uh, yeah, same thing with the center. We have our object and the center, just draw a line towards the mirror, like in that direction, and then it bounces back through the center. But uh, I want to do one more thing before we finish this topic. We're going to talk about a convex mirror as well. So for a convex mirror, I'm going to draw it. So it's like now we're on this side, so the mirror is curving away from us. So this is a convex mirror. And again, we put our focal point right in the middle. So let's start out with our object over here. And um, I should make the object a little smaller. So here's our object. So we start out going parallel to the principal axis. And now what we do is it's going to bounce away from the mirror. And so it's going to bounce as if it's coming from the focal point. So our ray 1 always parallel to the principal axis, and the reflected direction we get by looking at the focal point. So it's coming from that direction. Now ray 2 is going to go towards the focal point, just like before. Except then when it hits the mirror, so if we continued, it would go through the focal point. But it's going to reflect back parallel to the principal axis. So that would be ray 2. And we can see if we trace the direction of this ray backwards, looks like these two are going to meet here. And we're going to get a very small virtual upright image here. And then ray 3 would go through the center and bounce straight back. So if we just draw a line from the object to the center, but, you know, make it a dashed line on this side of the mirror. 
yeah, no, the, all three should meet up at the same place. So, uh, yeah, just slightly variations of the basic idea for these three principal rings, one, two, and three. And again, there's nothing really special about those, except that we can actually draw them somewhat accurately just based on geometry. For an arbitrary direction, you know, you'd have to figure out like the normal direction, where it hits, and then use the angle of incidence and angle of reflection. That could be fairly difficult. So these three are just, you know, special. They follow the same rules as every other ray we could draw. It's just that they're, um, you know, they're easier to draw because of geometry. Okay, so what we're going to do next. Uh, yeah, this is something, again, in a normal class, you know, questions like this can end up on an exam. Like, draw the ray diagram for this. It's kind of hard to do because not everybody uploads, you know, the, the answer would be a picture, which, you know, kind of hard to do online. So I don't think I'll have any questions where we have to draw ray diagrams, just because we're online. So I think, uh, but it's still important to know. So when it comes to mirrors, what we ultimately want to know is like we have our object and it's a certain distance from the mirror. We want to know about the image. Like where is the image going to be? Is it upright or inverted? Is it you know, magnified or reduced in size? Is it real or virtual? And these diagrams are a very good way of answering these questions, but not a precise way of doing it. So what we're going to do next is come up with a way where we can, you know, we're going to come up with an equation for uh, light reflecting off of a spherical mirror. But that'll be a different topic and it, it complements what we're doing here. We're actually going to use ray diagrams to derive the equation and uh, yeah, then it just complements what we do here. So it's generally a good idea to do both. Uh, if you can, if you have a problem, very good, um, even if all your answers are numerical, like where is the image, you can just plug it in the equation and get an answer. But I think it's a good idea to draw a ray diagram as well. And you know, when the two things agree with each other, that's usually a pretty good sign. But uh, I think that's it for these diagrams. And again, something in class, I have like a worksheet I'd hand out. Maybe I can put that online and you can print it if you want and do it. But, uh, or maybe I'll find an online simulator that would work as well. So, uh, yeah, I'll do one or both of those. It's good to practice these ray diagrams. But, um, yeah, I think that'll be it, uh, it for now.